Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentary films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren, en de Bali is zo'n plek. Thank you, Nina, so much. I'd like to invite Diego on stage. That's it over here. Yeah. Jaegor Ospov Gipsch, please. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Another um, co author. You, you speak Dutch, but we'll, yeah, your, your English, English is better. English. Yeah. Another co author um, of this book. And um, y yourself, you are very familiar with um, protesting in uh, uh, Russia, being part of the opposition. Um, uh, Adam talked a little bit about that, how. You cannot say that, that it's completely gone or impossible mm -hmm. uh, for the opposition to, to exist. What, uh, what protests did you take part of uh, and when was that? And also, um, how, how much um, room did the uh, authorities basically give you? Well, I, I, for the first time, went to protest on the 5th of December 2011. It was the next day after the rigged parliamentary elections of mm -hmm. 2011. And it was basically the moment when I think most of people of my age joined the protest, which was basically dead since the 90s. And then I went on to protest at most of those mid of the demonstrations. And you were, were how old? I was 17 at that moment. So yes, it was it was it was hard. I should say there were people were locked up in schools. For example, I was locked up in a school on the 10th of December of 2011. It was a huge protest in Moscow, and all students were locked up in their schools, even though it was Saturday. So we had to run from police to security. It was quite they, romantic. They locked you up in school so that yes. you wouldn't take part in, yes. in, in protests? across the whole Moscow. Uh -huh. yeah. But they couldn't do that when you were 17. I mean, apparently you could go out on the streets then. Mm, well, if you really wanted, you could escape. Mm. And how big were the crowds? Well, on the on the Chisti Pudi, on the 5th December, it was 5,000 people, and it was a lot. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable. And then in a week, it was more than 50,000 people. So if we speak about the room, yes, it seems like there was a lot of room back then. But already back then, it seemed like we have little to lose. And now looking back, well, we lost almost everything we had to lose. And, lose. and how much of a surprise was that to the Russian authorities? You said protests was basically gone until 2011. What, what changed? Huge. The surprise was huge. They didn't know what to do. And uh, Putin personally believes that this is Hillary Clinton who organized all of this, mm -hmm. that we were paid. That's and, when uh, it all started. And yes. I'm waiting for my money from, from the State Department, yes, for that. But, that, that, is, is that the propaganda they spread, or do, do you believe he actually believed that? I think it's the same. They spread what they believe in, mm -hmm. and, and vice versa, regimes start believing what they say at a certain point. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure, yes. Just as we discuss how the, the, the final words in, in, in courts, you know, somehow, even if it's only for a couple of minutes, give, gives at least the impression that, you know, um, uh, Russia is okay with a certain form of dissent. Was it the same with these protests? I mean, did they crack down on it right away, or did they let it develop for a little while just to show that, you know, Russia was a democracy? No, I think they never did. They never, they simply didn't know what to do. So when they came up with the idea that, oh, we can make up a provocation, which happened on 6th of May of 2012, mm -hmm. when basically police beat up a lot of people, and then they started the Bolotte case trial, in which they imprisoned more than 28 people, mm -hmm. they didn't know what to do. And uh, I, don't, I'm not, I don't think that they were yes, showing that there's any sort of democracy, and it was, mm -hmm. they were lost. 
How often did you did you take part in these these protests, and did it become more difficult over the period of time? I think it has to do with the internal problems of the oppositional movement, because that it consisted half of the people from the 90s who were used to the old, uh, I would say, dynamics of dissidential post-dissidential thinking, and of new politicians like Navalny, etc. But they could not come to any common ground. There was no program. There was no positive action whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And they basically wasted the energy of 1,000, 100,000 people in the streets. Mm -hmm. That was one thing. There were and all these different factions. Yes, yes. There were a lot of different factions. And uh, they were coming together only with the purpose to show, yes, that we are here. Let's make a selfie at the demonstration and go back. It was the society of, of experience. It was. What, what was your faction? What was your main? I mean, obviously, you know, democracy. But what was your main, um, the main reason for you being out on the streets? It's a good question. Well, uh, uh, just. I think I think the answer here is that the the like human rights is not only a political uh, issue but it's a psychological issue. If a country has no human rights, there it's people are very different. You have to fight for it, and if you're born to fight, then you will fight. Yes, but I think my 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 main reasoning is that yes, to to be treated as a human, to teach them, mm -hmm. to teach you as a human being who has rights regardless of whatever you say and whoever you are. Mm -hmm. Was there a political party I could belong? No. Mm -hmm. Was there a movement also? No. No. When did the protest in, in, in this size um, eventually die down? That's a very good question. I, I think mean, I don't need a date, but what, no, no, what happened? Understand. Did Putin just exhaust people? I think there were more, after, after this Bolotnaya Bolotne demonstration, there were more demonstrations that were already considerably less in size, and there were people who were getting worried already. Mm -hmm. I think what comes to my mind is there was a big influx into the protest after the annexation of Crimea and uh, the, the war on Ukraine mm -hmm. that Russia basically started. Uh, and uh, there were considerably more people on those demonstrations than before. So mm -hmm. I would say that by 2013, it was clear that mm -hmm. nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. is, is that when you came here? And was there any, I mean, were you so disillusioned that you Yes, yeah, so I was. I worked as a correspondent for Radio Svoboda, for Radio Liberty, and it became pretty. I was covering all these crackdowns on civil society on, in, in, in the city mm -hmm. as well, and it became pretty obvious to me. Yes, and when I saw, just like recently, he bragged with the nuclear weapons in the federal address. Four years ago, he was standing there and annexing Crimea, and I remember seeing those pictures on the mm -hmm. on the screen. I said, "Okay, I'm out," mm -hmm. and that was what spring 2014, and in September 2014, I was here. What, what's left on the streets right now? I mean, we're six days ahead of a presidential election. So there, there are obviously other candidates. But when you look at Russian TV, you look at the Russian media a week before the elections, what do you think? I, I, I don't watch. I don't, I don't know. I, I know there. Yes, I know. You can't stomach it? Or? Yes, what, what is... Hmm. I, 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 mean, I think Sobchak is doing a great work in talking about things that are not talked about on, on the television in general. But... It's not a way forward. It's not. It's not to way to the future. I don't see any point in participating in, in, in that at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you talk about the street protests, there was a lot of conversation in Western media when, in last spring, there were a lot of youth that came into streets on 26th of March, mm -hmm. and everyone immediately placed their belief in them. That oh, we're young Russians. Who are they? What are mm -hmm. they going to do? Well, I'm not that optimistic because hmm. well, they still have no agenda, they still have no, no understanding what they want, and the protest is successful when the elders hmm. join the youth and not when a lot of youth comes into the street. So if you are not in Amsterdam but living in, in, in Moscow or St. Petersburg right now, you would be too disillusioned to be out on the street. You would not be protesting yourself. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Well, it's, it's a, it's I, hope to, I hope to say yes. But yeah. What, what do you think? You worked on this on this book, obviously. What, what do you? And when you hear these, um, um, uh, you know, these these final speeches, the way the way and, and, and Nina p performed them, does it make you sad or even more disillusioned? What, what do you think? What do you make of this? Yes, I think I think I think that's a very. It's very sad. And it's, it's basically a feeling of grief, I would mm -hmm. say that. And there was a, a moment in the end of our work on the book that we had some more space that we could use. And we were looking for new authors to mm -hmm. translate. And I found, we, we found uh, new people to say pretty quickly. And we were so happy. And when I realized the source of my happiness, that in the months there were new, new thousands of new political prisoners, well, I, 
what can I say? It's the it's the progress, the reverse progress of imprisoning more and more and more people on a daily basis is just huge. And I recently spoke to a friend of mine who who is in Russia, and she said to me, yes, like I feel that at a certain point it became that if you go to the demonstration, you should be prepared that you don't come back home, but you end up in prison. Mm -hmm. So. You said that how, how Putin uh, spread the word and, and believed that, that Hillary Clinton is his big um, uh, enemy um, was behind these protests and the American State Department was. Uh, obviously it wasn't, but did you receive any help from, from the West? I mean, in, in, a, in a good way, have Western organizations uh, been, been useful to the protesters or, or did they basically leave you out in the cold? You're, you're uh, laughing from the, from the beginning. From the beginning, when I started asking this question, <laughs> I think uh, 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 the answer is no. Answering your question is no. No, no help. No help whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it could be much more. And I think that is one of the biggest problems we should address here. Because, for example, when there was uh, Timbuktu here in the Bali in, in the last June, I asked him what the Netherlands have done to help gays when, and children. When who was here? Sorry. Ten Broeke. Ten Broeke, uh, yeah. I think the next uh, foreign minister asked him what the well, Netherlands he, have he's done. He's been thinking he's the next foreign minister for about ten years. Ten years? So I, don't, okay, yeah. I don't think it will happen. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I asked him what if the Netherlands watching, have done to help gays in Chechnya, <clears throat> and he gave a five-minute utterly vague answer that we should not impose our values on other societies. And, well, I left to wonder whether human rights are, according to Minir Timbruka, are foreign to Russians mm -hmm. or, or to Chechens or to... And is this a, a, I mean, that's a sad response. Is it a common response? Does it, does it get any braver than this at any certain time? Well, when there is a lot of fuss, when there is a lot of uh, noise, yes, they saved this journalist from Nova Gazeta, Ali Ferus, finally. Mm -hmm. He is in Germany, luckily, because of enormous effort and also help from the West, but there are... Uh, the, 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 the amount of work that could be done to help people and also help in a different way, not to just, yes, let's, let's educate them, that, because that is what the current, I would say, more left liberal agenda is very much against, mm -hmm. that, oh, we should not, yes, indeed, tell the people how to live. Mm -hmm. But if there should, would be a different thinking here as well, that this is not a society of liberal values, but a different society of maybe, I don't know, networking or mm -hmm. maximizing benefits for, for our, our own selves, directed towards humans, then maybe we'll be thinking about humans mm -hmm. across the borders, and we will not be thinking about the borders as such. So we should develop some, some different view probably to, to survive, because mm -hmm. just talking about human rights might not work any longer. Won't get you any further. Yeah. That's a good point to answer. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Arnold. I would like to welcome on stage now our main guest, uh, because she came all the way from Moscow, Tatiana Glushkova. Thank you. Did you enjoy his story? <laughs> I didn't understand the word. You didn't understand the word. It was, it was a good story, but we'll, we'll focus on your, um, on your work right now. You uh, work for the Memorial Human Rights Center yes. um, in Moscow. Yes with uh, officers all over the place. For those who don't know Memorial, can you, can you describe um, what, what the work involves? Sorry. Uh, Memorial uh, started uh, in uh, 1987 as um, a group of, uh, several groups of activists uh, all around uh, uh, the country, uh, whose purpose was to um, to memorize the memory of uh, the victims of political repressions of the Soviet era. However, very soon it became, um, uh, uh, they understood that uh, the work, uh, they cannot work on, uh, focus only on the historical work uh, while the human rights violations continue to exist. So, um, that's why Human Rights Center Memorial was found as one of memorial organizations. By now, there are more than 50 memorial organizations uh, in Russia, former Soviet countries, and also in Europe. So um, uh, all of them do different work. So some focus on historical work, some on human rights work. I work for Human Rights Center. 
A couple of years ago, uh, I think it was 2012 or 13, but, but correct me if I'm wrong, President Putin demanded that NGOs such as Memorial would register as a foreign agent. Why did he do that and what were the direct consequences for your organization? Uh, it happened in 2012. The foreign agents law was passed um, that year. Um, the real reason, in my opinion, was to uh, limit uh, the um, space for civil society in Russia and to um, limit the, uh, the opportunities of the organizations to receive foreign funding, to receive any funding at all, and to get um, the support of the society because foreign agents mean in Russian means spy, and it's the meaning that can be found on the dictionary. So it's not, not something that NGOs invented. <laughs> um, and without foreign funding, there's, there's uh, no... There is, uh, yes, um, Russian authorities uh, claim that uh, state funding is, uh, that there is state funding, that there are so-called presidential grants, but uh, it is uh, not um, easy to receive them if you're doing real human rights work, if you're criticizing the authorities. So um, uh, the, m most of them are received by so-called gongos, government-organized, non-government organizations. And um, mm, that's why in Russia, uh, an NGO, a human rights NGO, which does uh, real human rights work, usually cannot leave without receiving foreign funding. You're a lawyer yourself. The, 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 the work of Memorial, is it about spreading, getting information to the public? Is it mostly about helping um, people in court get, get legal assistance? Or is it all of that? Uh, we do uh, several types of work. Um, first of all, we do documenting of human rights violation in the North Caucasus, and the work of Human Rights Center Memorial started as uh, uh, documenting uh, the situation on the North Caucasus in the, during the first Chechen war, the first Chechen conflict. And uh, we also uh, provide legal help, uh, both on the national and on the international level. Uh, I myself work uh, within the program Human Rights uh, Protection Through International Mechanisms, so I work with the European Court of Human Rights primarily. Um, the, uh, so we have also the so-called political prisoners program, so we keep the list of political prisoners. By now there are 143 persons on that list. Uh, uh, we also do uh, monitoring of the situation in uh, the Central Asia, of human rights situation in the Central Asia, because in some countries like Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan, there are new human rights NGOs or groups, so everything uh, that can be done is done from abroad. Mm. Uh, um, around the time Putin uh, wanted you guys to, to register as a foreign agent. I, I was doing a report for the program I work for in, uh, in Moscow and visiting Memorial and they said it's, it's good that you're here now because a few months from now we'll be closed. Um, there Memorial was, was in trouble but, but right now the offices or at least some of them, most of them are still open. Why doesn't Putin simply close them down? Good question. Um, probably because... I'm glad he didn't, to make sure, but... <laughs> probably because he um, um, doesn't want to... Um, so he doesn't want to make his relationship with the Western countries that bad. Because by now, uh, well, still... How is that going? Yeah. <laughs> um, if uh, um, Putin wanted, mm -hmm. every human rights defender would be imprisoned by now. Right. But uh, we're still free. That's why we pre should presume that he doesn't want that actually. Do you go to work every day um, expecting it could be one of your last days at work or not? not like um, it could be, yes, uh, every day can be the last day, mm, not maybe of uh, 
me at my work, but last day of memorial, mm -hmm. because uh, any time, uh, 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 any day, the investigators can come and search and mm -hmm. take uh, all our documents away. And uh, um, every doesn't that create enormous tension in, in your office yeah, with, with, you, with you? Well, um, we. We have uh, we have been living with this uh, since at least 2012. So mm -hmm. we have used to we have got to get used to it. Uh, just one more thing I would like to say uh, that uh, we have well, uh, in 2014 when first organizations uh, received that enormous fines of uh, 4,000 euros, 7,000 euros, we were shocked when. Mm, each uh, judgment was delivered, but by now, when an, an organization, a new organization, is put on the foreign aid list and it gets that fine, we like, mm, okay, it was expected. Mm. Today is actually an important day for Memorial. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, we've uh, lodged our observations regarding the foreign agent case with the European Court of Human Rights. So it means that we replied to the European Court's questions on this uh, law and on the, this group of cases. Meaning basically that this is your counter action yes, against to put in, putting you in that category. And, and, and what will this change? What, what, how hopeful are you that this will? Well, um, I think that our chances to win the case in the European Court are pretty high. However, um, I don't think that uh, it will actually lead to the implementation of the judgment. Uh, so that the uh, implementation of the law or the law itself will be changed. Mm. Arnaud, uh, uh, you were a correspondent for seven years in, in Moscow. Did you often, often deal with Memorial? How, how important yes. for foreign correspondents was that organization? Is that organization? Um, I was most impressed with their work in the Caucasus, um, where it has always been difficult to work for human rights organizations, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes also for journalists to make a story about uh, abuses. Um, but exactly in those places where most people give up, uh, Memorial has always been continuing to work. And I think they have an enormous uh, support among many people in Russia mm -hmm. who maybe don't shout it from rooftops, but who know that, that there are still people who are doing this, this type of work. Everybody knows Memorial, basically. Yes, I think in general everybody who wants to know something in Russia knows. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's a highly educated population. It's a very uh, cultural population. It's not uh, as if there are, you know, everybody who wants to know, find out more about the truth mm -hmm. can freely do so. Mm -hmm. And, and in, if you would write about Memorial or, or visit their offices or, or somehow be involved with them, would would that be problematic either for you or for them? Is the government very wary of foreigners dealing with, with Memorial? Um, actually, it became more wary, uh, speaking about 2012. Um, I also noticed a sort of a change when you left Moscow uh, to do stories that, uh, well, first of all, there is, there is an FSB office in, in the tiniest town in, in the middle of nowhere in Siberia. So it was always the case that if you went somewhere, mm. the people that you would speak to, they would say, ah, that's, that is the FSB following us, or they have already phoned me, mm. uh, simply because, well, I imagine some people simply are doing their job. They sit in this uh, little house and they are the FSB and they should know what's happening. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, uh, but after, uh, to, uh, in 2012, it sort of became uglier. So that's really, uh, and I think this is also the effect of um, the state television, which is anyway very, has a huge impact uh, on the whole country because it's the only medium that I think is viewed uh, can be viewed and listened to everywhere in Russia. Um, so there was a sort of a yeah, change of, of mm. atmosphere. But, but personally, I have never uh, mm. been, been harassed or something. But people started to ask questions, like I said in my small presentation, mm -hmm. like, aren't you like a spy? You know, <laughs> what are you doing here? Where's your badge? <laughs> yes, where's your spy badge? 
Let's yeah. talk about the elections, which are um, uh, this Sunday, and uh, you know, it, it's it's the Putin show. Uh, if 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 you take a scale from complete free elections on the one hand and a, and a complete farce on the other hand, within that range, where do these Russian elections stand? We obviously know the outcome. Um. Well, they would really tend toward the farcical end, I think, of the spectrum. Um, uh, but it's not like people don't know that. Uh, it's, I think it's very difficult to, to talk about Russian elections um, uh, or about support or non-support for Putin. It's, it's really difficult. I've spoken to so, so many people, also or business people or, or young people who, who couldn't start a business uh, or business people who know that, uh, as somebody once explained to me, I shouldn't, I, you know, I'm doing well, I'm reasonably successful, but I'm careful not to be too successful. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm too successful, somebody will notice mm -hmm. and I will lose everything I have. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think everybody knows in what system they live, uh, but uh, everybody to whom to who you ask, but uh, isn't it? Uh, this is not a good democratic process. Uh, shouldn't it be changed? Then they say, wait a minute. Uh, what do you propose? Mm. Do you pro propose uh, Maidan or revolution? Because thank you very much. We don't want it. We've had enough of such things. This is a very strong, it's, of course it's used by the state, but it's also a, it's really an ingrained sentiment. Mm -hmm. Like We do not want to go back to trouble on the street times. D despite you calling it a, a, a farce, or almost a farce, w would it be fair to say is that even if it would be a complete fair vote, I mean, Putin would still win. Uh, he's popular. Yeah, but it's like, uh, that too you know, an opinion poll, if you go into a, 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 a room with, with uh, two chickens and, and then you, uh, you put a third chicken and you say, what's your favorite animal? It's, it's going to say, well, chicken, obviously. There's nothing else. Right. Uh, and and uh, this, is, this is also what's, you know, if you have completely sort of gotten rid of the whole, uh, like the political theater, where even the opposition parties are sort of, you know, uh, Zhirinovsky owns something like 16 houses. Mm -hmm. He is a very wealthy person mm -hmm. for being the clown of the opposition mm -hmm. for all these years. So these people are uh, rather well rewarded for mm -hmm. their role as what they call the systemic opposition. Uh, so, and, and, and people who want to know this, they also, they also do. Let's talk about the chickens and, and also about Zhirinovsky because I think he's in, in our next uh, clip. And, We'll look at the clip in a second, but first I would like you to introduce, um, to tell the audience who Xenia Sobchak is, because she's, she's in this video. Uh, I think Ellen referred to a fantastic piece uh, in the Volkswagen, this your, your newspaper, yep. this past weekend by Tom Fenning. Yep. Uh, it basically was a portrait of this lady, Xenia Sobchak, yep. but also by following her, a portrait of of these elections? Who, who is she briefly? Yeah, she is, uh, she is a socialite. Uh, she was a sort of a, a reality TV star. So, so that, that sounds like Paris Hilton, a socialite. Um, well, well uh, I, then I chose my words well. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, she's well known she for is, other things. No, she is, of course, she's also a very intelligent lady. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she is also the daughter of the former, uh, I think, mayor of uh, St. Petersburg, uh, 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 connected to Putin. Uh, in, in sort of uh, uh, her father was uh, was somebody very important to Putin, and so in a way she stands under Putin's protection, uh, I think, uh, at least so far. Uh, so she has a very, uh, and this is what indeed uh, Tom Fenning did very well. Uh, many threads, uh, you know, you can weave around this person, uh, which makes her an interesting person. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, definitely she has, uh, she, can, she can really explain well uh, what is her criticism of uh, current politics mm -hmm. in Russia. So uh, um, cheers to her for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question was, the question some people posed when she started this campaign was, why are you doing this? Why are you, why are you letting uh, President Putin use you in this way? Mm. Because. Uh, the real opposition leader would normally have been uh, Navalny. Navalny. Uh, 
uh, he was in very obvious ways uh, sort of blocked from participating. Uh, and th there is Xenia. Uh, so th th some people were asking this question, like, aren't you sort of uh, uh, letting yourself be used? Let's look at her. I think uh, th this, this is a clip from a talk show on uh, Russian television, um, which was aired last week, and uh, it was not boring. Let's take a look. Bautinov is so boring when you look at when you look at this. What are we looking at here? Mm. Well, uh, this is supposed to be uh, debates of the candidate uh, of the candidates for <laughs> presidential for the it post of the debate. president. Yes, yes it, um, it is supposed to be a debate, I think, but I wouldn't call it a debate. What do you make of, of her and her presence in, in Russian politics? What does it mean? In my opinion, it means that, uh, so uh, um, I absolutely agree with our note that she's under Putin's protection because no one uh, else could have said uh, what she says from federal TV channels uh, and uh, I still have uh, access to these channels because she um, Said so. It's an attempt to um, make persons who would have voted for Navalny to go to elections and to go to the uh, uh, elections and to vote for her. In my opinion, it's that because, um, uh, as you know, after being blocked from from participating in elections, uh, Navalny uh, called for. Um, not participating in 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 them at all. And uh, in my opinion, the and after that, uh, Savchak appeared and uh, decided to uh, um, to go for elections. So, yeah. in my opinion, so she is uh, the candidate for those who would have voted for Navalny. Uh, there are really not so many people who would have done that. So, uh, even in my opinion, so you asked uh, the question whether, so the, uh, if, if the elections were really fair, would have put in one. In my opinion, he would, mm -hmm. even the elections were absolutely fair. Mm -hmm. uh, so his, uh, he, wouldn't, he would get more than half of the votes, mm -hmm. but n not 70%, mm -hmm. n maybe not even 60%, mm -hmm. but he would have won. Um, and she, she's uh, the candidate for liberal persons because her uh, her views, everything she says, it's uh, the uh, um, the things that Russian liberals would uh, want to hear. And um, Yablinsky, who is also kind of democratic candidate, he doesn't. Um, he's a, he's a candidate. 
mm -hmm. too, but he doesn't, uh, uh, no one believes in him mm -hmm. <laughs> right now because he has been in Russian politics since 1991 mm -hmm. and he has well, done nothing. <laughs> Putin hardly campaigns himself, it seems, or am I wrong? Why? It's, it's true, he doesn't. Well, he does, but uh, he doesn't participate in the debates. So his campaign he doesn't participate in the campaign in the traditional meaning of the mm. campaign. He doesn't uh, participate in the debates. He doesn't meet with other candidates. His campaign uh, exists uh, uh, like uh, he was the only candidate. Mm. So they, like ev there are other candidates who uh, talk to each other and who <laughs> but, and. There is Putin's campaign. Mm. They, they, they say, Arnold, and uh, I think then we, we can go to questions from the audience, uh, but, but it's been written maybe also in, in your newspaper that Putin has a 70-70 strategy, meaning he wants a turnout of about 70 percent and then he wants to win the vote by about 70 percent, a very clear win, but not an, 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 uh, an, a North Korean win of, of, of yeah. 100 percent. Is, is, is that the case? Is that the strategy? That is often like this. Uh, this the strategy usually fails in the Caucasus republics, <laughs> where uh, the government candidate anyway receives 99.3 percent of the vote. Uh, so there they, don't, uh, they didn't quite catch on <laughs> to how you should play this game. <laughs> but I wanted to briefly return to, to the, uh, because this is a, a very, this shows exactly what state TV is doing. So, you know, if you look at this, who would you vote for? Vladimir Putin, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you notice the, the interviewer was a really, uh, uh, I really think you are a hundred million times better than this interviewer <laughs> because he's so mean and devious and he even emphasizes, as you noticed, so, uh, you know, guys were voting for the president of Russia, the person who has to push the nuclear button. You know, do you want any of these animals to, to uh, get close to that? So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not... It sounds like uh, a leading question. Yes. Absolutely. And it's, it's set up to, to, to go like this. And this is what I said about Zhirinovsky. He is also, you know, he, his function is to... To, to be to, the clown. Well, to, to make such a an, an circus of it that, that, that uh, nobody, if anybody there would have anything mm. serious to say, mm -hmm. it would have been simply lost in, in this storm. Uh, I once did a, a really nice story when, because of uh, Pasha, uh, my friend, he had an old uh, uh, school friend who was, uh, became a school director and also uh, had to do this election. You know, it was like a, the, his school was also a place where the elections were mm. held. And, and th this is really a nice story because he said, OK, guys, uh, you just I will tell you how we do it. Uh, and he said in the greatest detail uh, explained uh, how much money they earn uh, for what they're doing, uh, but also that they get from uh, upstairs, uh, they get the percentages that these parties uh, should be getting, uh, how they fill the ballot boxes. Um, it's, it's hard work, guys. It's hard work. These people work for money. To uh, uh, yes. Um, um, uh, he was really drunk when we were there. Mm. Uh, he already finished. Uh, there was some controller uh, from another party who, who, with whom he already finished a bottle mm. of cognac. And he said, I don't think he's going to give us a hard time the rest of the day. Uh, and he gave us the percentages. And then we came to Jablko. And he said, Jablko zero. And we both had to laugh. We said, why, why zero? At least give them three. He said, no, zero. <laughs> so this is how it went. Yeah. And so uh, that's why I say, let's stay close to the farcical and mm -hmm. uh, while admitting that uh, if if you erase politics from a country uh, you also erase serious opposition mm -hmm. so um, this is sort of becomes like a, a chicken and egg question who, who you know right. why isn't there no opposition because they're all uh, so divided, yes, but Why also they because there has been some very clever game going on yeah. to make sure that there is no real opposition. Very clear. I'd like to uh, open the um, um, room for questions and uh, it'll... Does this work? Yeah. Okay. Please say your name and then your question. George Kate. Um, there was in a German weekly this weekend a story in which it was stated that at least 90% of Russian women will vote for Putin whatsoever. 
so he will be sure of uh, in the end that he will win because of the Russian women. What's your question? Do you think, do you feel with this uh, observation? Uh, I think that the percentage of Putin's support among the women is the same as among the men. <laughs> uh, Ellen wanted to say something. Yeah, I, wanted, I just wanted to say, I think what is very important is that um, at debates like these, especially just before the elections, we risk talking um, a lot about what Putin wants uh, and uh, looking at funny moments in, in the elections, which, of course, entertainment-wide, this is a fantastic fragment. Um, but I did want to emphasize, since we're moving away very far from our book, what, what we don't do in our book is actually talk about Putin and what he wants. Um, of course, today we do want to talk about opposition. That's a very logical topic in the run-up to the elections. But we move, wanted to move away, I think, a little bit maybe, Arnaud, like you in your book, from that sort of mainstream narrative of what mm -hmm. does Putin want, what does democracy mean in Russia today, to all these very different individual stories which are about, they are about opposition, sometimes political opposition, sometimes um, it's more about civic engagement in a broader sense. Um, but. But these um, election debates, you know, we have Thierry Baudet, who's a big mm -hmm. clown. Russia has Zhirinovsky, who's a clown. Uh, but that's not what the story of our book is about. So no, I no, think that's, that's important to underline also for the yeah. discussion. I think the work that Memorial is doing is much closer to what we do, because you're also looking at all these individual court cases right. um, and the, the court as a platform for civic engagement. And, uh, of course, um, but given the fact that the elections are six days away, we, we, we need to. We can't leave the topic completely aside. No, we can't. But it's easy to move away from yes. things and Putin. Yeah. First of all, I want to agree with Ellen very much. And, and mm -hmm. secondly, I want to ask you, Tatiana, what do you think is the way out of all of this? Of? As, as the way out of all of the situation in which Russia is, as someone who works in a human rights organization such as Memorial, what is the strategy to to change to, get, to, get to rid change, of the to change, to change the paradigm? Agents? Yes, to change mm -hmm. this labeling this going back to Cold War mentality and uh, yes, this is that and this is it. Mm -hmm. It's a really good question and <laughs> I'm not sure that uh, I can give you an answer um, because uh, the, uh, uh, the situation may change if the uh, mentality changes a little bit. Uh, Russian mentality depends really much on what is on the TV. Um, so uh, change the TV mm. and you, you change uh, the country. And like um, Russian journalist Anton Krasovsky said that give me access to the first three federal channels and I will uh, um, make Russia uh, from, so Russia from a homophobic country will become the most gay supportive country in the world in three months. So uh, yeah, it's, it's what what's Russian mentality is. Um, but I think you also specifically meant for Memorial how they get out of the... I think it's all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what is needed to uh, mm, what do we need to change uh, the TV agenda? <laughs> That's another question. Mm -hmm. We won't solve that in the next few minutes. Uh, more questions about, yes. My name is Raymond van der Bolgaard. Um, my question would be about the judicial system in a broader sense, because the the court cases that we are talking about, uh, although very important, are of course a tiny percentage of the total number of civil and criminal cases that pass through uh, hundreds, perhaps thousands of courts in, in Russia. Uh, and my question would be, do we have any idea how the judicial system in a broader sense is, is dealing with the present situation. Are they disheartened? Are they cynical? Are they, um, um, do they have any sense of judicial independence from uh, the executive powers? Uh, 
do we know about that? Is, is justice in a broader sense still being done in Russia? Thank you. Uh, yes, um, this question is much easier than the, than the previous one. Um, in Russia, we have buildings <coughs> named courts, but there are no courts in the meaning of this word in Russia right now. So uh, the uh, independency of judiciary, so we, in fact, there is no independency of the judiciary, and you have an independent judge only in case you are, have a civil case between two persons, none of which has uh, um, Russian word blood uh, um, in uh, so connections with the authorities, let's say so. so. Um, if uh, there is a criminal case, so the government against uh, an individual, so there is 99.5% like that uh, the individual will lose. Uh, even in the situations when um, there are very clear evidence that the person is innocent, so uh, there is so uh, less than 1% of acquittals in Russian criminal cases. If there, you have a civil case between uh, an individual and, a govern and uh, the government, so 99% that the individual will lose if, even if the case is really clear. So uh, the independent judiciary in Russia exists only in very, very few number of cases. Yes, and if there is a case uh, uh, between an individual and business, so the um, uh, percentage, so uh, uh, the opportunities that the business will win is also very high. Maybe not 99%, but also high. Simply because uh, it's not about the uh, money you pay to the lawyer. It, sometimes it is about it, of course. If uh, if we're talking about the case between individual and business, in some cases it is about that. But in some cases it's also about the connections between the... Uh, yes, uh, there are. No, it's not about the bribes in, um, in the traditional understanding. So it's not about a person coming to the judge with uh, the bag of money. No, it's not about that. It's about uh, that that if a person has serious business. He he usually has some connections with the authorities. He is someone's brother, close friend, or so on. And the judge is also someone's uh, daughter, and so on. I wanted to mention that uh, all those candidates, uh, also, uh, so, uh, thank you, uh, also the serious ones, uh, or at least uh, uh, Yevlinsky, Grudinin, uh, Sobchak, uh, each and every of them, uh, name uh, independent uh, course of justice as one of their agenda um, yeah. uh, that agenda punten. Dus, uh, hoewel hun uh, verdere agendas heel ver uit elkaar liggen, onafhankelijke rechtsgang, uh, th that's what they all share. So, every uh, oppositionary really stresses, empathizes uh, independent uh, courts. But if I may, may add just one uh, uh, practical example to your question, it was in, exactly in this Kirov, uh, Kirov Les uh, uh, trial against Navalny. Um, at some point, he was um, uh, he was actually put to jail. So uh, he was standing there, and uh, the uh, judge was reading the verdict, and they immediately took him into custody. And this, uh, I was still in Moscow, and uh, this led within an hour and a half to a spontaneous uh, demonstration at uh, Manezhnaya, very close to the Kremlin, uh, to which I went. And I saw one of the most interesting things I've seen in protests in Russia in those seven years. 
there was near chaos. So it was not an organized protest. There were people who were extremely upset <laughs> at this decision. Uh, there were, uh, there were uh, Omon, there were police who were trying to let traffic still continue. Uh, and I had really a sense that it's like uh, on the verge of being out of control. Uh, and this, this is what they do not want. Uh, so I think this modern type of, uh, and you see it in dealing with Navalny, it's also, it's like, and the same is why Memorial still exists. It's all it's kind of a thinking, what should we do uh, to, to uh, not let anybody come close to, to, to real power, but at the same time, uh, not pull the repression uh, lever too harshly, because we will also invite a reaction. Uh, and Navalny was then, so this was basically a mistake by the judge, and Navalny was quickly released. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so this is, I think, well, an example of where you see how, the, how this system works. And also taking into account what the audience thinks. So mm -hmm. let's not forget about that. Mm -hmm. It's not simply, it's not uh, 1930s, uh, come on. It's a different, different system. That's a Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But his brother did, didn't get this crowd uh, close to the Kremlin, and Navalny did. Very good ex example. Are there more questions? I think one or two at the most. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Yuri de Boer. Um, I have two questions, one for Tatjana and one for Yegor. Um, Tatjana, you mentioned the European Court uh, for Human Rights earlier on, and congratulations on the work that you are doing there and have just completed today. Um, no, I know the person. Russia is, is um, often suggested as a country that may want to leave the European Convention and the European Court and um, has stopped its payments to the Council of Europe. Can you reflect a little bit on what the consequence would be for human rights defenders, but also for ordinary citizens, if Russia is no longer part of that mechanism? And my question to Yegor would be, um, congratulations on, on, on the book, um, but do we need part two? Do we need more human rights defenders, ordinary citizens being convicted? Is, is that a way forward? I mean, obviously not, it's a rhetorical question, but um, you see a lot of younger generation activists leaving Russia um, temporarily, some go back, some stay abroad. What is the future for human rights activism for, say, under 40 years old journalists, human rights defenders, academics in Russia? What, what, what is that space, or are they becoming a part two eventually? Okay, Let, let's start with the first uh, question re regarding um, the Council of Europe and Memorial. Well, uh, of course, if uh, Russia leaves, uh the Council of Europe, uh, the, uh, well, I wouldn't say that the situation with human rights will become worse at, the, at that very moment. No, because the situation, so Russia is a member of the Council of Europe and the situation <coughs> has been worsening for several years by now and is continuing to worsen and uh, so there is nothing that the European Court of Human Rights or the Committee of Ministers can do about it. But if Russia leaves the Council of Europe, we will lose one of the most important mechanisms which allows us to um, get international recognition of human rights violations. So uh, it leads me to, the, to another question which was not asked, but which I have, uh, have to reply to. Why are we continuing to do that in the situation when the judgments are not implemented? So Russia pays the compensation, but does not actually implement the judgments. Um, the main reason, in my opinion, is that we're doing it for future generations, for them to uh, have uh, information to have these cases documented and to have recognition that this was a human rights violation. Of course, uh, if Russia leaves the 
Council of Europe, uh, we will still have uh, UN committees, but uh, in my opinion, they are much less powerful mechanisms, uh, just uh, for the reason they are not the court. So they do not deliver judgments, they deliver their views. But if this happens, of course, we will do uh, what like Central Asian uh, countries do, like uh, we will go to the UN committees. <laughs> Thank you. The, the final question was for uh, Ye, given the time we have to um, end there, about the future of uh, activism for the younger generation under 40. No. Yeah, answering your question, no, more people should not be in prison, but they will. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, what should be done by young people? First of all, yes, you should leave the country if you can, because there is no, nothing noble about putting yourself in a position where you can't do anything. And jail is worse than Amsterdam. Uh, and what I think the, the thinking what should be done is that not only about Russia, but people in all these countries that are, are, are in a situation as Russia, they should not see them as special. The, the, the world should not end on their own country for them. Because Russia is still solving some similar problems with the rest of the world. We're still on, the same, uh, on some of the same tracks. And if you see yourself as a part of a global fight, as a part of a movement that go into many directions, then probably, yes, you will have more support as well from the new networks and links which we do not yet understand. They are there because we know only what existed and we know only what fails, but we don't know what works. So there is no clear answer, but probably that is the, the, the direction to go, I would say. Thank you so much. We, we have to leave it here, um, but uh, as always, these evenings end with, uh, well, first of all, uh, come back to the Bali. There are great programs every evening. And second of all, the bar is open, so any other questions for Jaegor or for Ellen or for Nina or for Arnaud or for Tatjana, um, uh, you can... Um, I just made sure you have to stay here for another two hours to answer <laughs> questions. <laughs> But anyway, um, thank you so much uh, for coming. All the guests, most particular uh, Tatiana Glushkova, who came all the way from <laughs> Moscow. <laughs> Good luck with your work on behalf of Memorial and everybody. Thanks for coming.